See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ to which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause you trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Well, I don't really know what to say. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we should just end the service now. It's been a good time. Just sing the last song and, and, and call it a day. I suppose in some ways Paul doesn't know what to say anymore. Um, so much so that uh, I think he's given up on a scribe writing the letter, um, and he's now taken it into his own hands. I'm not sure if this is an indication that he's slightly blind, or that he just is not the kind of person that likes writing. But he says, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Uh, either that, or he is um, doing the uh, one thing that you should never do, and that's write in all capitals. Um, but I don't know how you do that because Greek is all capitals. So if you look at the original language, it's all capitals. So I'm not sure what he's doing, what he means by uh, uh, see what large letters. I literally think he is he's taking up the whole page to write what he is saying now. Um, but what this tells us is that, um, if anything, Paul is writing this in his own hands, this last part. Uh, particularly his, his conclusion, his signing off to them. Uh, this makes it very personal. Uh, you know, you can, you can get a letter written on behalf of you and your signature is just signed at the bottom. But he, he's very intentionally signing this letter off in a very particular way. He's saying, this is, I've written this. Uh, I've perhaps dictated most of it, but this section, just know, this is me. This is my handwriting and I'm addressing you. Nobody else. This isn't a forgery of some sort. This is, this is serious. Um, perhaps it's also the kind of thing of, you know, you can get a letter if you were in school, you can get a letter from the school saying, you know, well done, you, you, you did well, or you did something badly and you shouldn't have done it, and there's a stamp on the bottom of the page. But you know when you, when you get that, that kind of letter, whether it's your certificate or whatever it is, you pick it up and you can see that, that ink pen mark has been actually engraved into the paper. You know it's gone underneath the principal's nose or under the important person's nose. Um, I know I've got one or two letters that was, you know, today's day and age is different. When something gets typed, you never know if the person really typed it themselves. But when you find a piece of paper in front of you that you can actually see that embossed signature on the bottom, uh, it feels a little bit more authentic. And I suppose that's what Paul has done here. This makes this letter that much more authentic. Um, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hands. Well, we are wrapping up uh, Galatians. This is the last little section, and I almost want to say, well, I don't know what to say, but there's plenty to be said as we come to the end of this, uh, this letter. The other issue with this uh, letter is that it's kind of detached from our circumstance. We don't have this particular issue in our church or perhaps in our society today as much. This is a very particular issue that he is addressing. There's been incorrect teaching within the churches of Galatia where they have experienced a, a wave, a movement of teaching saying that they need to go back to the old ways, particularly being that of circumcision, of who you eat with and all of those kind of things. As we see Paul addressing Peter at one point saying, you know, why do you change your activity. Suddenly people arrive and now you don't want to eat with these people because now they're not 
they're not associated with what? With us. You know, you're changing who you are based upon the company that you keep. Uh, beyond that, the, the issue here is that they are deviating. The biggest issue of all is they're deviating from the gospel. And what I mean by that is Paul's concern here is that the churches in Galatia are shifting their focus from Jesus Christ back to works, to deeds, to laws. And this is a major issue. Um, and so the, the issue of circumcision is really that shift from going from focusing on Christ, who they heard about, who they received, who they acknowledged, and shifting back into a very old system and saying, why are you wanting to do this? Why are you actually wanting to do this? What's the purpose? And so that's been this big issue happening throughout the church or the churches in Galatia. And perhaps for us today, we sit here not being able to make those connections, but very subtly and very uh, in a very strange way, we do similar things. Uh, we, we judge our faith based upon how nice we are to people. Or, you know, we, we live a faith that is slightly more works-based, but not, we wouldn't want to say law-based, as it was for Israel. Uh, circumcision is not a thing that we push as, a, as an agenda, as it was for them in that time. Because Israel, it was a mark of being an Israelite. You had to go through that process if you were a male within their society. But here and now, for us today, it's slightly different. What are the marks that we have that make us Christian or that make us what we used to be before we came to know Christ? Perhaps that's the kind of question we need to ask. What are the things that we used to do before we came to know Jesus Christ? And how are those things permeating into the church and influencing how we conduct ourselves, how we share time with other brothers and sisters? And is that affecting the word, the gospel that we declare? Those are the kind of things that we need to maybe consider. Because, as I say, the issue is slightly different. But there is still those realities. It is a shifting back to an old way. And how often do we shift back to an old way? You know, we, we, we've got, uh, everyone here basically has a device in their pocket that has got a fantastic feature on it that everybody is terrified of trying. But some of us have tried it before. Have you ever gone into your settings on your phone and hit factory reset? <laughs> by, the, by the nervous laughter, I am assuming some have. <laughs> it resets your whole phone and it goes back to the way it came out of the factory. Literally factory reset. But in some ways, we, we do that from time to time. We, we dance with this factory reset button in our hearts. And we jump back to our old ways. And they permeate in and they affect the way we think about the gospel and the way we share with one another. And I just want to say, what is your factory reset? <laughs> Where do you go back to if you hit that button? I want to say our factory reset button should really go back to how God created us. Uh, a little bit further back. Not, uh, not how we came out of the second box. <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. You know, when you went and bought it at the second hand shop. I love buying stuff at second hand shops. But a factory reset should take us all the way back. All the way back to the, the way we were made, made to be. But what I want to say for us this morning is really reflect on, on what you say. What you do. How you conduct yourself. How you live your life. Listen to the conversations you have with those around you when it comes to the gospel. How much of your life prior to knowing Christ influences what you think about him now? I mean, there's so much studies out there that you can even go and look at. And we are examples of that. A very good example is, what do you think about God as a father? How do you see him as a father? If you've had a good father, you may see God as a good God, a good father. If you had a bad father, you may be influenced to see God as a bad father, a distant father, a slightly absent father. Those are things that affect the way we communicate the gospel. But Paul in this passage tells us that we are a new creation. We are no longer defined by our past, but we are now a new creation. What is a new creation? Something that is new. Not second-hand or recycled. It is new. 
fresh, absolutely shining, brand new. And so Paul says there in verse 15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision mean anything. What counts is the new creation. What God has done in you through his son. That's what counts. It's not about who you were, but it is about who he has now made you to be in his son, Jesus Christ. Declare that. I mean, it's very simple on one level, but complicated at the same time. As I say, you do that, and you sit here this morning and go, yes, that makes sense. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. And you walk out the door and reset into something else. We do that so often. I can almost guarantee it. Zon's smiling at me. Because I'm probably going to climb in the car, and something's going to happen on the way home. And I'm going to reset to my old ways. That is how quickly it happens. That's how quickly we go back to our old ways. But today, you are a new creation. You don't need to reset to the old ways. And if you do, well, there's good news. There's grace. There's mercy. And he's going to lovingly, patiently endure he, may, he might sound every now and then, that I love that part in, in, in the Gospels, where it's such a beautiful example. He, Jesus doesn't give up when people revert to their old ways, but his disciples still haven't clicked that he's the Messiah. And what does Jesus say? How long must I still be with you before you get this? He doesn't give up on them. He's just like, guys, come on, stop going back to your old ways. This is the reality. This is the good news. Let's go a little bit further into this section. Verse 12 reads, Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted from the cross of Christ. Now, again, complicated, different context to us, and that's okay. But again, I want to ask the question, how often will you revert to your ways, to your familiarities, to avoid a sense of judgment or persecution for being a Christian? Now, maybe we don't see persecution the same way as they were seeing persecution, but how many times have we subtly and quietly changed our our slant because we didn't want to outright look like one of those Christians. And I say Christians in inverted inverted commas. Where people go, oh, it's a Bible basher. Or whatever it is. Perhaps we are slightly and subtly just slanting how we interact with people because we don't want to come across as a nuisance. Or maybe we feel insecure about our own faith. That we're not yet 100% sure that what we believe is right. That we've got it down. That we can communicate it. You all have been sitting here long enough. You can do it. (laughs) You know it. You do know it. But we we go into these state of minds where we shift. And we say, oh no, but maybe I'm not going to say the right thing. And, And the past you comes in. Of doubt or insecurity or uncertainty or whatever it might be. There's so many different things that can kick in with us. You've got to go through your checklist. First question. Maybe we start first question from now, right now. Why are you here? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Ask yourself that question. If you find yourself busy reverting back, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Everyone said yes. Okay. Next question. Do I believe that he died on the cross for me? For my sins? Do I believe that he is raised again? Do I believe that that grace that he has shown me, he shows everybody around me? 
Do you need them? Then you got it. That's enough. That's, that's a starting point. And that's enough to share. Again, the context here is they were reverting away from it. They were shifting away from that focus. They were saying, no, in order to get there, whatever the context was, you first need to be circumcised. And Jesus says, come. Come as you are. You, you don't have to tick boxes. Just believe in me. Just acknowledge that I am the Lord and Savior of your life. You don't need to jump through hoops. It's a lot easier to come to Jesus than we allow ourselves to believe. I know growing up, I had this thing, and this is perhaps my voice, my reset voice that I have. But growing up, I always had this thought, I will come to him once I've sorted a couple things out. No, he's, he's just not going to accept me because I'm just that little bit too unrighteous or I, I, I just need to solve this issue in my life before I can come to him because I don't think he's going to actually accept me those are conditions that we create they are lies do you know that? if you are telling yourself that today that's a lie Jesus says come no ifs, no buts just come to him. Here's the scary reality. Paul goes on in verse 13. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law. And yet they want you to be circumcised, that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. Now there's two ways of looking at this. Again, as I said, their context. But when you live a life of trying to do things, to try and tick the boxes or get life in order before you come to God, you're not going to get it right. And the person sitting next to you is not going to get it right. There is nothing that you can do to save yourself. You can try. Circumcision didn't help Israel or the Jews. And none of our deeds today, anything that you can think of, is going to help you to save yourself. So there's two sides to this. Hear that? If you are trying to save yourself, stop. And now, take a deep breath. And stop trying. It's been done. There is nothing that you need to do that Christ hasn't already done for you. And then this is why Paul can say this. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul recognizes that there is nothing in this world, nothing. What do you hold dear? That can compare and be boasted about in comparison to the Lord. I mean, I couldn't help but uh, reflect on yesterday with, with Dante's wedding. There was an absolute focus <coughs> on the Lord. But, but what a special moment a wedding is. When you, when you look at that and you think, wow, these two are staring into one another's eyes and the world is theirs. And they are just in love with one another. And what a fantastic moment. Even as much as you hold your spouse dear to you, in that moment, God is mine. And there was a beautiful moment where they did share that at least. But there is nothing, not even your wedding day, can you boast in as much as you boast in Jesus Christ. And that was a very special moment. Think of other special moments that are valuable to you. Never boast in them except in Jesus Christ. And as Paul then said in verse 15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Understand? Nothing, nothing, nothing compares to what Jesus Christ has done. As he has started the process of creating in us a new creation. 
And he says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. There is a sense that as we sit here this morning, we've, we've heard different sides of things. We've celebrated and we've mourned together as a family. But if there's one piece of good news, it is that Christ has the power to save. And that when we rest in Him, when we rest in His goodness, we find peace and mercy. <laughs> There's a real sense of peace and mercy. I mean, I want to share this as well because I heard yesterday, and I don't know further details. And in the news that Phil shared with us about Dirk, was that he had, re, he had come to the Lord again. And as it breaks me to hear of a life that is also just so quickly snuffed out, there is this joy to know that he is reaching out to Christ. And what a peace that brings. What mercy is that? There's so much in this life that we could chase after. Health, wealth, whatever it is. May we never boast in those things. But may we boast in Jesus Christ this morning. Paul is a, a little bit more uh, worked up, if I can say that. It seems so. In verse 17 he says, From now on, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I think what Paul is trying to say here is, Guys, you know this. You know this truth. Don't make it harder than what it is. It's actually very simple. Don't cause me trouble. He says, I myself bear the marks of following Jesus. <coughs> this morning, let us follow Jesus. And life is going to cause a couple marks on us. We're going to have some, some bruises and wounds from life's knocks. But may we carry those, those marks because of who we know, Jesus Christ. That there is no cut that is too deep. There is no bruise that won't mend in the sense of being able to declare Jesus Christ as Lord. In the face of your troubles, may you hold on to Jesus Christ. May you not change your gospel message and revert back to your old ways. May you stay true to the gospel. Let us not cause one another trouble sitting here. But instead, sharpen one another. As iron sharpens iron, may we remind one another of Jesus Christ and the centrality of His goodness, His word, His grace. And so Paul ends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. And I pray that for each and every one of you this morning, as you leave here this morning, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. When there is a flicker of doubt in your mind as to the certainty of the gospel, or whether you are reverting back to the old ways and old habits that may still be ever so slightly ingrained in you, may you remember the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that He has done it all for you. And you can rest in Him. You can find His peace, and you can find His mercy. And just as we experienced that this morning, we can experience it as a family together. His peace, His mercy, as we rest in Christ Jesus. So as I said, Galatians is a complicated book. 
complicated letter. But as Paul concludes this, hopefully there's a level to which we can relate to it. A way in which we can look at this and say, Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing else that I can do or say but declare you. For you have done it all. And may my every action and may my every deed bring about peace and mercy in the lives of those around me. And may my spirit know your grace all the days of my life. I pray that for you. I pray that for each and every one of you. May you know Lord Jesus Christ's grace, what he has done for you today. You don't need to be the old you because he has created a new you today. If you believe Hold tight to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the time that we've been able to work through Galatians and this letter that Paul has written that we still have today. And we thank you that these are things that we have learned. These are lessons that uh, your church has been learning over the centuries. And that as we look at it now, there are still such deep truths for us to, to learn from. May we never replace you with anyone or anything else in this life. May we rest in you, trust in you, depend on you wholeheartedly with all of our being. Whether in good times or bad times, may we boast in the name of Jesus Christ. May we boast in the name of Jesus Christ. What a joy to boast about you. To boast about the one that gives life, new life. To boast about the one that sets us apart. Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone here this morning, and even those that couldn't be here, may we reach out and boast in the name of Jesus Christ. Boast about Him and what He has done for us. May we encourage one another, build one another up, love one another in Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.